it's a, like a wave and a particle at the same time as well. Yeah, it's got it's both real, properties. Real mystery. But yeah. then when it collapses, it turns into the electron. Or, so once you observe it, once you measure once it, you it collapses it. into one little position. That, that oh, okay. The big mystery to me is the observation idea because mm. is it is it more of what we're measuring? Are we measuring reality wrong? Like it's not a, our technology isn't advanced enough to measure what's really happening, mm-hmm. or is it something like we do? kind of influence reality with measurement or observation or something else in the measurement process. Mm-hmm. That's a strange yeah, there's, there's, there's two thoughts on that. Number one, one would say that when you are measuring something, you are interfering with the system. So for example, if, if I want to observe something in a microscope, okay, and let's say we're in the really small scale, we're looking at electrons, um, the just the act of me trying to look at it that I have to shoot a photon at it. OK, so if, what light we know is it can act as discrete um, little packets of energy. We have to shoot something and that just by shooting a photon at it, uh, that will affect um, the, the electron itself. It'll it'll you know give it some momentum or do something to it. All right. And so that act of actually measuring does change the system. Um, all, wow. So there's that kind of thought. Uh, although um, I think that uh, in the Copenhagen interpretation, uh, as far as I understand, um, that does it just nec- it just collapses. <laughs> uh, when in, in the, the observer's I guess behavior is a little more mysterious than that. Um, and uh, you know Niels Bohr, if he was alive today, he would just say, "Well, this gives us the right answers." <laughs> you know, get probabilistically, obviously, gives us the right answers, and um, that's good enough. I think now uh, a lot of physicists are saying, no, that's not good enough. Oh, Dr. Richard Lombardini is an associate professor of physics at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. Dr. Lombardini got his PhD in physics at Texas Tech in Lubbock, Texas, after getting a bachelor's degree in both mathematics and chemistry, um, also at Texas Tech University. And then Dr. Lombardini pursued a postdoctoral fellowship in computational chemistry and physics at Rice University in Houston, Texas, under the guidance of Dr. Bruce Johnson. His prior research is in wavelet functions and computations and theoretical calculations involving nanophotonics. And Dr. Lombardini's most recent research interest is in quantum field theory. If you could kind of give us in the audience a basic idea of what quantum mechanics is. When somebody says quantum mechanics, a lot of people get very excited about that. It is a theory on how uh, things in the microscopic world uh, behave. You know, when we're talking about things like atoms and molecules and even smaller subatomic particles, neutrons and protons, and even, even, even smaller than that, you can break down protons and neutrons into constituents called quarks. When looking at that small uh, those kinds of objects at that that scale. The normal physics that we think of, which uh, we call Newtonian physics, okay, but what we experience, um, it doesn't work anymore, it, or it, it just it just fails completely. This theory developed called quantum mechanics. There's a lot of weird things in quantum mechanics. <laughs> a lot of strange things that happen. Mo- one of the weirdest things I would think is the fact that particles can behave can have wave-like behavior as well as a particulate behavior. We call that kind of the uh, wave matter duality or particle wave duality or something like that. And so these different behaviors um, can manifest in different situations. And that's a very bizarre thing because, you know, we know what a wave is. If you you think of um, light, um, you think of uh, microwave radiation, you think of uh, radiation from your your cell phone is in the form of waves. Uh, and then you think of like a baseball and that kind of acts like a something that's concentrated in space. Um, and you think to yourself, well, how could something exhibit both of those properties? Well, in quantum mechanics, um, very, very small particles do exhibit uh, both of those qualities or, or an area of quantum mechanics, which is the actual physical interpretation of what is going on when we're not observing something. The, the traditional um, interpretation that is adopted is known as the Copenhagen uh, interpretation. What that means is that you can represent a quantum system, which could be an electron or two electrons or with something called a wave function. What is weird about this wave function? Well, um, first of all, well, one of the good things about it is this wave function 
is what we call deterministic. You can um, predict the evolution of something in, in time. You can predict it using equations. And so how does the wave function rep re represent your system? It only gives you probabilities <laughs> of where of your system. And when you say your system, do, are mm -hmm. you saying like, like the, a the human system, or, no, or I'm just talking about like a microscopic system, like a okay. electron or something. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't tell you exactly where the electron is. It only can tell you information on probabilistically where it is. And Newtonian thinking: if they were identical, they should all be in the same spot after a certain time period. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't happen in quantum mechanics. Um, what happens is you will have the electron. You will find the electron in still in different spots. In different spots, even though they're completely oh. identical, and you do this experiment over and over and over with identical electrons, you're going to get different positions of where the electron is. When you're not observing it, it's basically present in all these different possible has all these different possibilities, and they're all possible, meaning that it's it exists in all those places, um, and there's certain probabilities, okay, that it will exist. So it's just kind of smeared out in space. Once you observe the electron, it's going, that wave function collapses, they say, and you will find the electron in one spot. Einstein thought that perhaps, and this is something that's not known as much, but he thought perhaps that wave function actually represented uh, what he'd call an ensemble of particles. So a bunch of identical particles. So it represented, and so it was mm. actually a, a statistical uh, thing and then, let's say when you're not looking at the electron, when you're not measuring it, it's this particle. It's this big cloud of possibilities. Mm. Okay, that's what the wave function is. And then once you measure that electron, you find it in one spot. Mm. Okay, so it's actually the observer plays this massive role mm. in determining where the electron is. And Einstein was like, "Well, I don't like that. Why does the observer have to play?" in the reality of the electron. Why can't the electron have oh. its own reality independent right. of the observer? Didn't that come from the double slit experiment where the there's multiple lines, inter like an interference pattern or something like that? So let's say they can, in the double slit, they can send one electron. And what happens is the idea is that electron, if it's just a particle, then it should be able to, it's gonna either pass through one or the other of the slits. And, and then in the end, they have a screen at the very back that the electron hits. And once the electron hits it, then uh, you know where the electron is uh, because that screen kind of tells you or lights up where the electron hits. And so um, that's the observer. That would be the, the thing that would um, cause that screen would cause the, uh, I guess you could say that wave function to collapse at a certain point. So if the electrons acted as just little points in space, like what we think of like baseballs and ping pong balls and things like that, then you would find a pattern where you would have some electrons traveling through the left slit and slum, some traveling through the right slit. But what happens is something completely different. What happens is um, you get these, these patterns, like you said, these, these long lines of patterns, and basically they're just they're just strips that contain lots of where lots of dots in it where electrons hit. Bright slit with lots of electrons hitting, dark. Then you have a bl another bright slit, dark. And so it's kind of like they're they're alternating. Mm. And what that looks like is a lot of people will look at it and they'll say, well, that looks like an interference pattern. Then that means that what if the electron actually is this kind of permeated wave in space. And then when it hits the double slit, actually some of the electron goes through one of the slit and some of the electron goes through the other because it's this wave permeated in space. And then that wave can interfere with itself and produce this interference pattern, okay? But the, the thing is, so where is the collapsing happen? Well, when the, when the interference pattern hits, um, the, the screen is then you get a dot on that screen, then it collapses into one point. And those dots, what they find is those dots start forming a interference pattern as if it was a wave. So there's this kind of this mix of two things going on, wave and particle duality. Uh, and so, so the idea is this, perhaps this electron actually is this kind of wave that is permeating space. And then when it hits the screen, it collapses into one position, 
but the pattern that is produced um, is as if the, it does confirm the fact that the electron had to kind of go through both slits at once and interfered with itself. Um, and so there's a lot of weird things going on in there. Whenever you do something to one particle, it automatically affects the other particle because they're entangled. They're in this, this one wave function. And, um, you know, in, in, in quantum mechanics predicts that this can happen, this entanglement can happen. And so if you measure this one, automatically this one changes. And so the reaction is faster than, the, than what the speed of light would be if, if, if they were exchanging information. And Einstein didn't like that. He was like, no, nothing can, can travel. Not even information can travel faster than the speed of light. And so he, he was very worried. Uh, he didn't like that. And therefore, and him and, and these other two scientists developed the EPR paradox, which later was... Um, challenged with uh, an Irish uh, physicist uh, with last name of Bell, and Bell devised something called the Bell's inequality, and, and basically it was a, a way of testing whether the EPR paradox was correct or not. And um, and so uh, later on, once the technology developed, um, people found that well, the EPR paradox actually uh, there there actually is entanglement, and there actually is this instantaneous change. And people have been able to do this entangle photons and then they they measure the photon here and it, the other one is completely is affected instantly and so it wow. actually does happen you know and so that is that is no it is and isn't it like the particles could be several distance away like oh yeah there's i don't know what the record is right now um i know that uh scientists are trying to see how far they can get push it. yeah that's so cool <laughs> yeah. like, wow. now we've actually verified it with experimental Yes, it's that actually been verified. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's just that to me is crazy. It is, uh, it really is. That's why I'm so interested. Yeah, yeah. What the many interacting worlds interpretation of that could be is that you have these two particles, let's say, in one world that are very far apart, and perhaps in another world these two particles are closer and they can interact. And since information can travel between the two worlds maybe that's what could cause this. And so, you know, you could, you could use the, the many, many interacting worlds to explain it that. Is that why they say like black holes kind of like morph like physical things? Like, you know, when in the movies, they, they, they go into a black hole yeah, and then they twist so. the, the aspect of like reality, just yeah, like yeah, well, bending and just. Like, yeah, because light itself gets bent into black holes. So if, if you can imagine there light itself can be bent in a black hole that can really distort reality in a sense does um, um does gravity is it the gravity of the black hole and the because i i think i under from what i remember is like the greater the mass the greater the gravity kind of thing or yeah the more mass the, the stronger the gravitational so is that to say that gravity affects time in some way uh because gravitation also yes and 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 this is measured in in labs nowadays Right, like, like, actually, was, gravitational fields do affect time. How time, right, right. and that, and you watch the movie Inter. Have you ever seen the movie yeah, Interstellar? Interstellar? Yeah, Interstellar. That yeah. they did a great job in that because if you were on a planet, and in, in part of the movie, you're they, this the Matthew McConaughey and and the other two people I can't remember the names, but they were on a planet that was near a black hole, and their time moved much slower. Then the their uh, their uh, friend who was on the ship that was further away from the the planet, and so their time scales were moving differently. The people that were on the planet near the black hole, there was a very strong gravitational field, and that was distorting time. So that's and that has to deal with general relativity. So that's kind of going beyond in a subatomic level. Just the mm -hmm. but we're composed of several atoms. You know, then is that aspect exponentially produced? You know, ah, that? so this is a great question. So this is the same. Uh, have you ever heard of Schrodinger's cat? Yep. The particle can both exist and have decayed. It can be both. Okay, mm -hmm. it can exist or not decay, and it can decay. All right, so it can have both possibilities all at once. It's once you look at it, once you observe it, then you will see it's either decayed or not. But quantum mechanics says that when you're not observing it, it's a mixture of both. So suppose that you have that, and it's it's attached to a device that is connected to a box, okay, and inside the box you have a cat. Um, if, and this device will release poison into the box if the particle decays, 
and will not release poison in the box if the particle does not decay. If you're not looking at the cat in the box, is the cat in a superposition, we would call it, of being alive or dead? Is it both a mix? You know, does this quantum mechanical paradigm, um, if it's related to our real world, our macroscopic big, big world, does it also bring that, also, that same paradigm to us as well? Mm. Okay, so that was a big thought experiment. Now, I don't know if anybody's done this, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Is it but, almost like the idea of like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, did the tree really fall? Or <laughs> so that's a great, so that's the whole idea of, of does the observer play a role in the existence of something? If a tree falls and nobody sees it, does not really fall, right? That's the question. Does it produce any noise if there's nobody to hear it? Okay. I, I firmly believe it does. I don't think an observer needs to be present for those things to exist. I think they can exist uh, without any sort of observation. To quantum mechanics, does that ever seep into mm -hmm. like consciousness? Um, the possibility that there is a quantum mechanical kind of theme in consciousness and especially in the formation of thoughts, okay, in particular. So if you, you, may, have a, um, you may have a thought uh, or in your, your prefrontal cortex, you may, have, you may abstract different possibilities in your mind, but uh, the question is, well, which possibility do you choose, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and could it be that, that po those possibilities, they, they all exist in your mind, obviously, um, and the question is, well, um, how does the, that I would say wave function that represents all, how does it collapse to one choice, right? How does it collapse to that one choice? What, have, what leads into like about multi universes? So this is, so, so there, that's another thing. So, um, a lot of, uh, people believe in something called the many worlds hypothesis, and this is also due to quantum mechanics, instead of being. Um, a, a wave function that represents many possibilities. What if there's just, you know, there, you don't, so it's an independent observer. So you, you have, uh, let's say an electron and it actually does move in, in space, but um, in it, but when you actually measure it or some sort of quantum event happens, um, you have these different possibilities, but you only see one. Mm. But the other possibilities happen in parallel universes, okay? <laughs> uh, or you could say that, uh, uh, I think Sean Carroll is a very well-known physicist who promotes an idea that every time a quantum event happens, you get a splitting 